And I love this sermon. It's sort of a, I don't know, you'll tell me if you love this sermon, but I love this period because it just sets the tone for what it is. Tomorrow's sermons, Rabbi Megdal will be speaking here, and my sermon over at the Hyatt, it has more substance. It's more weighty. And tonight is just getting us, transitioning us from uh, where we were into the holidays. So I want to tell you about new friends that I made. Bruce and Karen. They're actually friends of a friend. And Bruce and Karen live in a modern Orthodox community in Israel. They are wonderful people, and they told me a story that I continue to think about. When I met them over the summer, we were up in Massachusetts together, and I really I, I couldn't believe it. So a number of years ago, they spent Shabbat with the Jewish community in Kenya. The story of the Kasuku community is worthy of a separate sermon, but periodically Israelis and other Jews visit the community to teach. The Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs of the conservative movement has been engaged with this Kenyan community as well. Uh, Bruce and Karen describe the community with such passion and beauty. And by Western standards, the village was very rustic, we would say. Bruce described Shabbat. They gathered in a simple room, daven through the liturgy. He said it was a wonderful experience, even with the dirt floor and the mud walls, the smells and sounds of the village. As they got closer to the Torah service, Bruce wondered where the Torah was kept. He didn't see an ark. Maybe they had a small scroll someplace. He was curious about the minhagamakom, the customs of this place. And he noticed that there was something under a talit on the table. That must have been the Torah, he thought. Ein kamocha Elohim Adonai ve'en kama'aseha. And the congregation rose and they revealed a well-worn Hertz humash. The addition of the humash that we take for granted is just one of the many, many copies. This one in particular is the one I got for my bar mitzvah. But this community cherished it as its own Torah. They read the Parsha and the Haftarah from it, and then, Vezot Torah, they lifted the book because this was their Torah. They honored Bruce by asking him to offer a Dvar Torah. And Bruce moved to the front of the room. A villager was prepared to translate his reflections on the Torah reading. Bruce talked about how inspiring it was to see a community so dedicated to Jewish learning and to Jewish living. He said in Israel, the entire country is built around a Jewish way of life. And despite the challenges faced in this village, this small community was thriving. Bruce noticed that the translator off to the side was conferring with another villager. So Bruce paused, he asked if everything was okay, did he do something wrong? The translator said he understood everything, but he was having a problem with the translation. He explained in their language, they do not have a word for challenges. Can you believe it? When Bruce told me I was stunned, the translator figured out a synonym, but I have been thinking about that. What does it mean that a language does not have a word for challenges? Language shapes culture. It shapes traditions and values. There is a village in Kenya where they probably know about problems and hard times, but they don't know about challenges. I can only imagine what it must be like to look at the world without seeing challenges. This year, we have faced many. I don't want to dwell on them, but I do want to honor the hard year that we have had. Rabbi Eliezer Zalmanov wrote in the foreword, the Talmud tells of two sages who exemplified this trait of always having a bright outlook in life, despite it not necessarily being self-evident. And many people know these rabbis, Rabbi Akiva on the one hand, and Nahum Ishkamzu. And in, in fact, 
Nahum's last name came from a phrase he would always use, Gamzu Latova. This too is for the best. He always trusted in God, and even when things seemed dire, he believed they would all turn out well in the end. Rabbi Akiva's phrase was, all that God does is for good. While similar on the surface, it carried a different message than Nahum Ishkamzu's saying. The difference between the two is that while Nahum found the silver lining in every situation, even when things didn't seem good, Rabbi Akiva never saw the bad. Everything that occurred to him was always good in his eyes. Where Nahum saw good within the bad, Rabbi Akiva only saw good. In many ways, including this, I am not as pious as Rabbi Akiva. I have seen a lot of the bad that has happened. I have stood at graves when only two people were allowed due to COVID concerns. I have sat with families as we waited for the funeral home to arrive for their loved ones. I have been locked out of hospital rooms and hospice facilities. And Gamzulatova, because we have also been creative in how we do services and how we do shiva minyanim and baby namings and classes and counseling, there's a midrash that I've been trying to track down. And most people point towards a sermon by Rabbi Ed Feinstein of Valley Beth Shalom in California. I cannot find a traditional source, but the story has appeared in rabbis and ministers sermons across the internet. So it must be true. The story resonated with me because there were times during the lockdown where I felt down. At those moments, I needed to make a concerted effort to pull out of the doldrums, those bouts of depression. The story goes that amongst the many Israelites who left Egypt were two men. We'll call them Shlomo and Yaakov. Slaves never look up. Slaves only look down because of the burdens they carry. And as slaves for their entire life, Shlomo and Yaakov had grown so accustomed to looking down that they could no longer lift up their eyes. When Moses brought the Israelites across the Reed Sea, they all had witnessed a great miracle. The sea parted and they escaped from slavery. The Israelites came to know that God had a purpose in this nation's history, but not Shlomo and Yaakov. For them, one asked the other, what do you see? I see mud, Yaakov responded. I see mud too. You know, we had mud in Egypt. We have mud here. Both Shlomo and Yaakov were unable to witness the amazing wonders that shaped the Israelite people as a nation. They missed the miracle of their escape. The sea split before them, but they didn't see it. All they could do was look down at the mud. There are times in our lives when we are truly stuck in the mud. We can't see the forest for the trees or the safety of the shore when we are in the middle of the mud. We lose the ability to see the bigger picture. The children of Israel passed through the Reed Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians and their chariots and horses were buried beneath the, beneath the sea. When we look closely at the story, the Torah tells us that as the Egyptians chased the Israelites into the sea, God locked the wheels on their chariots so they moved forward with difficulty. I think what happened is they got caught in the mud and couldn't move forward. So what did the Israelites see? Did they experience the miracle of the dry land upon which they walked, or were they more like Shlomo and Yaakov who could only see mud? To Shlomo and Yaakov, it made no difference whether it was the mud in Egypt or the Reed Sea. All they could do was experience the worst of their circumstances. This year, we have each had moments that felt like we were caught in the mud, drowning in the sea. At that point, we might have felt stuck or worthless or confused. We want to move forward. We know we have to, but we can't. And very often, these feelings evolve into anxiety and fear, which overwhelms us. But maybe being stuck isn't the problem. It's how we perceive it. 
Are we able to see the dry land on the other side of the sea? Are we able to appreciate a bigger picture even as there are challenges around us at the moment? Despite all these challenges we have faced, I choose to be optimistic. I choose to be hopeful. I choose to see the dry land rather than the mud. I choose to see Gamzulatova. And I continue to imagine being in a village or a community in which somehow they do not have a word for challenges. I can choose these outlooks because I know I'm not alone. And I, and I know we do not have to be alone in the coming year either. I do not know what 5782 will bring, but I do know that together we will respond to whatever circumstances presents themselves. Together, we will lean on each other because that is what it means to be part of a community. So may 5782 be filled with health and insight and the resilience which comes from being part of a community. Shana Tova.